We will. We will begin testing. That was the clue. Thank you, David. We appreciate you. Well, greetings, everyone. We are so pleased that you all are here tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, we certainly have a, a, a good night to be together. I want to simply say welcome to Kirksville, Missouri. Welcome to our William Matthew Middle School, and welcome to the 23rd Annual uh, Missouri Livestock Symposium. So I'm Andy Jackson, member of the Missouri Livestock Symposium Committee, and on behalf of the committee, we do thank you for being with us tonight. The first symposium was held the first weekend following Thanksgiving in 2000. And we are so proud to be coordinating and orchestrating that 23rd. Who would have thought? Little did the founders, Gary Mathis and Bruce Lane, uh, nor did the original committee even think that this program would be continuing through these many years. Obviously, we're doing something right because the crowd continues to come and we continue to feed them and it's always fun. Amazingly, we do provide education, food, and fellowship and we welcome you with this earnest hope that you will enjoy the program uh, tonight as well as tomorrow. We have an energetic group of worker bees um, that have worked pretty hard to bring you an outstanding group of speakers and certainly a great trade show. If any of you have any questions or need assistance in any way, please contact any of the Livestock Symposium Committee members. You will see them throughout the crowd. They're wearing the Symposium Committee uniform. It's bright yellow shirts and black jackets and caps. So uh, certainly don't uh, don't hesitate to, to talk to any of them if there are things that uh, we can do to, to help you uh, enjoy your time. We are missing a familiar face tonight, that of Gary Mathis, who is absent due to his health situation. He has coordinated and directed and led this event for these 23 years. And he continues to serve as chair of our committee. He certainly continues to contribute time, enthusiasm, and experience to guide and promote this annual gathering. And I know all of the audience and, uh, will join me in our sincere hope for renewal of, of strong here. However, assisting me on the stage is a longtime friend and supporter of our symposium, Dave Baker. He's Assistant Dean Emeritus and Associate Professor Emeritus, University of Missouri College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources, we call that Catherine. Dave is a recipient of the Outstanding Educators Award, has served as our Symposium Program Consultant, assisted with securing speakers, provides funding, and is a cheerleader for this symposium. And we do thank you, Dave, for your continued support and appreciate your assistance. Give Dave a hand. This evening, Dr. Robert Webb, the superintendent of the Kirksville R3 School District. We're quite fortunate that uh, he came to our Kirksville community from Alamosa, Colorado, and he brings with him extensive educational leadership experiences. He's a high achiever in his academic efforts, bachelor's degree from Black Hills State in uh, Spearfish, South Dakota, graduate degree from the University of Wyoming, Laramie and Doctorate of Education and Educational Leadership. In addition to higher education influences, we do know a little of his past history. He is well-grounded in agriculture. He had those youthful experiences from his family home sheep production. Ranches where he steered sheep and tied the wool fleeces and probably jumped up and down in that wool. You know how that happens. Perhaps that's the base of his strong work ethic and then that is what he has brought to preserve. Please welcome Dr. Robert Webb.
And that got me thinking, why don't we just send a bunch of heifers out to Washington, D.C.? Maybe that will help reduce some of the gases up there. All right. <laughs> Seriously, I am grateful and it's a pleasure again to offer our facilities to this great set of experiences. After all, all of us are just a bunch of perpetual students anyway. And I know of very few places where, uh, you know, the, sorry, the community, the communities around us know the commitment that Kirksville has to extending the learning experience for all of our students, and that includes those from zero to 99 and beyond. I know of no other place in all of my travels where you can start your formal education experiences at the age of four years old and stay in the same community of less than 17,000 people all the way to getting a medical doctor's degree. That's commitment, and I really appreciate that, that heritage. And this symposium to me is just an extension of all of that kind of experience. So, on behalf of the Kirksville Arts School District, school district, again, thank you for picking us to host this event, and some of my cousins out in Wyoming still say, Powell River, let it up. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Webber. We truly appreciate being here, and thank you for your continued support within the community as well as certainly the heart of our event. So, on behalf of the MLS committee, I do want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Glad you're here. Our ag industry continues to have challenges, as we know. Weather, economics, inflationary costs, political regulations, international conflicts, oh, pending railway strikes. But we also receive rewards, certainly from our bountiful harvest, our successful yields, the research, the improved genetics, productive livestock herds, multi-generational family farming operations, and definitely caring communities. But for this Friday night and for tomorrow Saturday, we encourage you to simply sit back and relax, share some laughter, share some optimism, share some pride, share some information, have some common interest in agriculture, and enjoy a good time together. We truly are blessed in our country to be able to do this. And now I have some neat folks who I want you all to meet. The first one is Dr. Brian Wigan, and he is a Mizzou alum with a bachelor's degree in animal science, a master's degree at Auburn University, doctorate from Iowa State. He's worked at Mizzou at his Mizzou alma mater since 2007. He was named director of the Division of Animal Science for College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources, that CAFRA group, in, 20, in 2021. As professor in the division, his assignments included teaching, certainly MU Extension, research, expertise, and meat sciences. Dr. Deacon is a Northeast Missouri. He's one of our own. He's a Northeast Missouri native. And in 2007, he made his way home to the University of Missouri as a professor, which enabled him also to return to his family farm near Cairo, Randall County, Drive Southlands. In addition to his responsibilities on campus, Dr. Deacon, along with his wife and daughters, run stalker cattle, they raise South Down and crossbred sheep, meat goats, and they have a small milking herd of the Toggenberg area. The family is all very involved and active in 4-H and FFA. He and his wife both are uh, tenure leaders within, within 4-H. They regularly exhibit at many state and national livestock shows. He's a meat scientist and livestock production is firmly ingrained in his DNA. I think he's the perfect person to bring the greetings from Mizzou to our livestock symposium. So, please welcome Dr. Wigan with our Mizzou chair, M-I-Z! Missouri on behalf of the Moon Choi, President of the University of Missouri System. 
Dr. Chris Dalbert, the Dean of our College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources. And uh, I was coming to the symposium anyway, so the double dip to bring you this, uh, this welcome uh, fits very nicely. Uh, there are very few places around the country, like the Missouri Livestock Symposium, that bring together the scientific endeavors that we see with the faculty and the experts that you'll hear tomorrow, and we marry that science with the application of animal agriculture so we can actually take that information and we can apply it on our farms and ranches. And I've been in that my entire life. I did grow up down here. My farm was split by the Macon and Randolph County line. So I'm really close to Kirksville, Missouri. So I want to give you just a few minutes of update. And I will have the bias of what's going on in animal science. But I can tell you in terms of the College of Agriculture, we have some things going in certainly the right direction. Our enrollment is up, and that's always good. The more seats that we have in the college, we can have those experts that are going to replace people like me someday, and hopefully they will stand up here and welcome the next generation to the Missouri Livestock Symposium. So the, the enrollment is up. Our research funding is up significantly in the college, and I'm going to give you some bias in that. I'd like to believe that that is due in large part to the Division of Animal Science. Uh, we, in the last fiscal year, uh, brought home $23.1 million in, in animal ag research funding. <laughs> if you need a benchmark, the last annual year higher, fiscal year high for our division was $10 million. So we topped it by $13.1 million in the last year. So we have a lot of things going in the right direction in that space. Our division at the University of Missouri in Animal Science is quite unique compared to a, a number of other land grant institutions. We have a really interesting portfolio where we look at applied animal agriculture. We also look at biomedical models. And we have discovery that's going on in models like the pig, where we're solving disease resistance issues in, in animal ag, and then some of that discovery finds its way into our school of medicine and helps improve the, the health of, of our fellow Americans. So it is a really interesting place to work. And, and I have a very diverse faculty, and they are they're absolute rock stars. So in the research space, uh, we're doing a very good job uh, as well. So in within our division of animal science, uh, we have been uh, between 18 to 22 percent increases in, in enrollment there. Right now, we're the largest single major in our college. Uh, we're just a few students shy of 500 uh, within the major, and that's uh, that's a five or six year high. Uh, so we're very pleased that the students are coming to us uh, to be educated in the animal sciences. We certainly have an incredible extension and outreach program. We still have the legacy programs that you know, the Show Me Select Heifer program. It is alive and well and very vibrant. If you see those sale reports, you know that there are really nice returns for good management decisions in the cow-calf space. So we'll along with those programs, we have some new things that are, that are coming on the forefront. You may have heard a little bit about it. Um, and through support by uh, great champions like our, our own director, Chen, uh, we were able to find funding to, to roll out a workforce development program in the meat processing space. And we're, we've got a group of faculty on our campus that are going to start uh, pulling out those kinds of programs. Uh, and we're taking the program to the people. We don't need to sit in Columbia and have everybody come to us. It's a lot better if we come to you. So we have those kind of new programs in the outreach space as well. So I, I am biased, I'm a Mizzou grad, I'm very proud to be a Mizzou grad, but I think we have that institution in many ways, especially in agriculture, going in the right direction. So very pleased to be here. Uh, I wore a suit tonight, when you see me tomorrow, I'll be in a banker's vest and a pair of black boots and jeans. So don't think that I'm just a talking head that showed up for this. Thanks for having me.
Tiger as an outsider doesn't say some things. Uh, for those who don't know, Andy Jackson is the only one that's not included in the script. The nice thing you said about her, but I can tell you, she has been key to keeping the other two in line. Gary and Zach, she has been key to uh, bringing closure to the deal. Um, she would typically send Gary and Zach to meet with me to get money from me to support those children for three years of administration. And uh, they wouldn't get done. They'd bring in a person who spent me within an inch of my life, and uh, they would get closure. But I think it's been a great team. Each have different skills. And Andy, I want to thank you for all you've done for this. Um, 10, 12 years of getting involved. Thank you for what you've done for this. Let's get ready. I get the distinct pleasure to introduce the person that I have. I have a lot of respect for him. And I came to Missouri in 1975 to stay by him. And I fell off the state, fell off with the people. And uh, I really fell in love with our next speaker. Uh, I've had the opportunity, as, as Andy said, to work at the university and things like that. But uh, I got an opportunity to work not long ago with Chris Chin. And I'll tell you what, folks, I've got a bio here. I'm not going to read it on your mother wants to hear it. But uh, it's, it's, she's been a leader. She's been a role model. I've worked for 13 records of Agro during my career. And this is very respectful, very strong leader. And uh, start out a quiet, reserved person that has stepped forward and done some things. And, and she's built on where she's been, her place. She trusted. Leader in the state, the president of the industry, taking on some hard issues over her career. That can um, and my operations. And then all the dead and she's now representing the next level with the uh, directors of that. I've got the thing of Chris and Rick, NASA, and uh, she's been in that leader in that. And uh, we're very fortunate to have her in the state. And, uh, and I'm very fortunate to have her friend. Uh, her and her husband, Kevin, have a 1500. Salver uh, that they throw to finish, and, uh, and a deep mill that I had the opportunity to go look at. But I actually didn't tell her it was coming. I like OSHA, it's not in. Uh, and I uh, had a chance to see it and look at it. And it's great pride to know her kids. I'm uh, thankful for all the teachers like my dad and mom. And Chris, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with you. I have the opportunity to uh, get the opportunity to finish my career as part of that. Also, thank you for everything. He's one of the best kept secrets that Mizzou has. 
And so when I saw that he was the one that was going to be here this evening, I thought, how fitting to actually send us somebody who is close to animal agriculture to the Livestock Symposium. Because he not only talks the talk, he walks that walk. And it's refreshing when you talk with Dr. Wiegand because he knows what it's like to be on a farm or a ranch. He knows what it's like to try and make ends meet. He knows how important it is for all of us to bring, be able to bring more value to the products that we're raising. If we can keep some of those dollars here at home, he wants to be a part of helping us do that. So Dr. Wiegand uh, is just a real gem for us and we're very lucky to have him at the university. Um, and so if you ever hear that he might be leaving, throw a fit. Uh, because we cannot let him get away from the University of Missouri and Missouri agriculture. As we all know, 2022 was supposed to be the best year for us yet. We were supposed to have high prices. We were supposed to, to be able to have good things happen to us. And what happened was we had high fertilizer costs that were three times higher than they should have been. Many of us who raised cattle were not able to fertilize our pastures like we would want to. Um, we had a drought. In the spring last year, we had a little nuisance for the poultry industry called high path avian influenza. And that was devastating to our poultry industry all across the nation. That's why you saw the price of eggs go up in grocery stores. That's why you saw your turkey prices jump up this year. Because unlike normal years when avian influenza comes to us, it normally goes north when the birds are migrating, the wild fowl, and it stays, it, it disappears. But what happened this year is it didn't go away. So as the birds started their migration back, it's going with them. And so we do have a few cases that have popped up in southern Missouri again this, this fall um, within the last couple of weeks. So one word of caution is if you have a poultry flock or you have ducks or any type of, um, of poultry or, or waterfowl, please be observant. Take extra caution with biosecurity. Make sure that you're protecting them. Keep your, your flock of chickens away from water sources where wild waterfowl could, could have the opportunity to drink. Um, make sure that you're maintaining good biosecurity. Don't wear your boots on somebody else's farm because we don't want to attract diseases. You guys know the protocol. Um, we were really hoping that this would not be a part of, of our, our fall this year moving forward, but unfortunately it has been. Um, so just want to give you guys a heads up on that. Even though we have lots of challenges in agriculture, the one thing that we have and we will never lose is hope. We all hope that this next growing season is going to be the growing season that is the best growing season ever. We hope that we're going to get plenty of snowfall this winter, even though that is a headache for us with cattle. We also know that we need to refill our ponds on our farms. Hay is in short supply. Calling has happened in the southern part of our state, especially where they were especially hit with the drought. Um, here in the last two months, the majority of Missouri has been in a drought status. Now it has gotten a little bit better, but it's a slow process. Navigation on our river systems is decreased. The Mississippi River, we have barges. Normally you ship 80,000 bushels on a barge and we're shipping under 50,000 bushels right now on our barges. This is troubling. This is gonna impact all of our markets. It's gonna make your feed costs go up. And so if you're a praying person, Please add rain to your prayers all through the winter. I know we need moisture from the spring. We've got to replenish our ponds. We need to make sure that the navigation system remains operational if we can. One of the biggest challenges that we're also faced with was a railroad strike that was impending. Um, that was going to be devastating because if we can't ship as much product down the river, we need to be able to have the rail system as an alternative. A lot of grain moves through Missouri on the rail system. Five of the biggest railroads of the seven railroads cross through Missouri in Kansas City. More grain is crossed through in Kansas City than any other place in the nation. And so it plays a very important role. So if the rail strike were to have happened, which it's been avoided, thank goodness, it would have had a very negative impact on Missouri's agriculture economy. And so we're very lucky that that was averted. But it shows you how delicate our transportation system is. We know how important our roads and bridges are, but let a, a bridge get shut down on your county road and you have to drive 25 extra miles to get to town. You really realize how important those roads and bridges are when that happens to you. Making sure we can get our products to market is very important to each and every one of us, whether we're raising livestock or whether we're like raising crops. 
And so that's something that we at the Department of Agriculture has been keeping a very close eye on, is making sure that our transportation system works for our farmers and ranchers. We want to make sure we can find a way to add value to all of the products that you're raising on your farms and ranches. Just last week, I returned home from a trade mission with the governor. We went to Israel, we went to the United Arab, Arab Emirates, and we went to Greece. And the one thing that was brought to the forefront is how lucky we are to live where we live. We have more arable acres of land than any other country in the world. When we were driving through the countries that we visited, it's a desert. They're trying to raise livestock in a desert. We think we have water challenges here. They really have water challenges over there. And in every single meeting that we went to, what they talked to us about was the importance of food security. They talked about how during COVID, they couldn't find anybody who was willing to give them food. They had the money to pay for it, but everyone was afraid of the supply chain. And, and the challenges that the supply chain system had too was another complication. And so these countries are really focused on how they can maintain their own food security. They're looking at vertical farming, how they can have greenhouses in the desert. They're looking at technology. They told us how fortunate we were to have that technology right here in Missouri. We have more plant scientists in the St. Louis area than any other place in the world. And these countries realize that and they see the value in that. So the one thing that we realize is that we've got to make sure that agriculture's voice is heard. We need every type of production to make sure we can feed not only our families, but a growing world population. Diversity in agriculture is good. Not every two farms farm the same way, and that's okay. At the end of the day, we all have the same goal in mind, and that's to produce food for our families and for our neighbor's family. And that was the one thing that was brought to the forefront of our trade mission, is how lucky Missouri farmers and ranchers are to be able to farm where we farm. So I just want to thank each of you guys for being here today, because each of us wants to find a way to continue to improve the land that we have to make sure that we can pass it on to the next generation in better shape than what we received it in from our parents. And so that's why you're here tonight, to gain valuable information, to learn about the new technology and techniques that are out there, to continue your education. And so I just want to thank each of you guys. You could be a million other places tonight. You could be at a ball game. You could be at home in front of your television set. Or you could be in bed sleeping. Uh, but you guys took the opportunity to come out here and be a part of the Livestock Symposium, and I commend you for that, because the knowledge that each of you will receive tonight is going to help you add sustainability and value to your farm and ranches. There's also somebody in the crowd here tonight that I don't know, he may get introduced or not, but he's been a strong voice in Jefferson City for each of you, and that's Representative Greg Sharp. He is a strong advocate for agriculture in Jefferson City. There's not many farmers that serve in our legislature anymore, and so it's a blessing to have someone like Representative Sharp be there to be the voice for agriculture, to make sure that farming and ranching is not forgotten. Because when COVID hit Missouri, the one sector that never got to take a day off was farmers and ranchers in the agriculture sector. Our agribusinesses, they still work every single day, and your Department of Agriculture is here to help support you guys through that. So thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you for being a part of the solution. And thank you guys for showing up and doing more each and every day. Tim was raised and currently lives on a farm north of LaBelle, right close to us, where conservation has been passed down through the multiple generations past, in terms of being a cow path, back cattle, wool crop, and timber operation. His current title is Area Resource Conservationist. 
and he serves as a technical advisor to NRCS employees in 30 counties. That's an area to cover. That area is in the northeast corner of Missouri. As a prior grassland conservationist, Tim has advised a number of livestock producers about the benefits and setup of management intensive grazing on their pastures. He's been a part of the Missouri Livestock Symposium Committee since 2001. He always has a very calm, providing leadership role, and his common sense guidance has helped so much as we plan this annual event. Tim will be representing NRCS State Conservationist Scott Edwards. Please welcome our friend Tim Platt. Um, and, uh, you know, you might think to yourself, you know, why is a, 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 a conservation agency such as NRCS, you know, what are you doing being involved in the in uh, uh, Missouri Lifetime Symposium Program? Well, you know, we, we, started, we started this thing way back, uh, what did you say, 2000? Yeah, okay, I, I remember that. I remember uh, coming out here and we had Baxter Black, I think, as our entertainment that night. And I don't know what this room I think holds 300. So we were we had uh, I think 700 people and we oversold the tickets is what we did anyhow. And so we were stacking chairs right in the middle to to, uh, to uh, try to get people in here. And unfortunately, uh, you know the fire marshal wasn't here to see that. But uh, usually what I, I'm wearing is a yellow shirt. But since I'm representing the agency tonight, I'm, I'm wearing a, a blue shirt. And uh, we are uh, glad to be part of the animal agriculture. You know, we really do believe that animal agriculture has a lot to do uh, with conserving our, our Missouri ground. You know, we started as an agency that, that, that uh, was uh, just looking at uh, soil erosion. Our, our story goes something like the fact that uh, you know, Hugh Hammond Bennett in the 1930s and the Dust Bowl days, uh, he went to Congress to, to say that we need, we need an agency that, that looks at uh, uh, soil erosion. And uh, so he got the he got the word that uh, the dust bowl cloud was going to come over Washington D.C. at a certain time. Now that's about the time he started talking to Congress, and so he talked to Congress about this need for a soil erosion service, and it had a, a, a strong uh, impact on them. So they formed the soil erosion service, then the soil conservation service, then the natural resource conservation service, and. Uh, so our, we, we expanded, you know, you'll see us in a number of things that you know, we, we spent 50% of our equipped environmental quality incentive budget on animal, animal agriculture. Uh, you know, we're into quite a few different things. Uh, we spend 10% of our equipped budget into wildlife. Um, you know, we're not just about terraces and waterways anymore. Uh, you know, we're here and, and uh, you know, energy efficiency, you're going to see something about a program that's called uh, you know, Weather Resilience, uh, establishing some uh, some forages on farms that, uh, that has an ability to make it through some of these uh, summer slumps, these hot, dry periods. So, uh, so we're, we're there. We're glad to be here. We're glad to be a part of this. And uh, I look forward to another 22 years. Of this. So, thank you. Missouri State Representative and his wife Sandy. They should be in the cloud for time. Uh, Danny and his wife. Uh, Mr. Greg Sharp and his State Representative, uh, 4th District, and his wife uh, Teresa. Mr. Lewis Briggs, 5th uh, District State Representative, and I'm not certain his wife Anne is with us, but uh, she is certainly a, a leader in her own right. We have with us uh, representing, uh, representing the Kirksville City Council. Uh, Mr. Bill Bonsall, Mr. Mark Thompson, uh, Adair County Commissioner, his wife Mindy, 
Bill King, who is also an Adair County Commissioner. Lois Bragg is with us. She is the in-district legislative assistant for the 18th sen uh, senatorial district. She is the uh, uh, strong assistant for uh, Senator Cindy O'Loughlin. She has with us with her her granddaughter on uh, Sunday who is with us. We also have Joe Brett, who is MU Extension Professor, Health Sciences, Columbia, Missouri. Joe, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we also have uh, Leslie Speller in Henderson, who is Education Director for MU Extension Nutrition, Home and Family. Welcome to you, Leslie. Um, Mitchell uh, Rice, who is a state uh, staff representative for Congressman uh, Sam Graves, he and his daughter here at the back of the room. Thank you, Mitchell, for coming. Ray Bozar, who is uh, Deputy State Director for the U.S. Senator for Missouri, Josh Hawley. Thank you, Ray. Glad you're here. Dr. Tim Walston, Truman State University, Division of Science and Math. Dr. Walston is with us. Uh, Mr. Dan Bruder, KTBO Director of Promotions. And Dan is with us. We'll be hearing a little bit from him in a minute. Marty Bachman, uh, editor of the Kirksville Daily Express. I think he is in the crowd as well. Let's give a round of applause and appreciate it. We certainly thank everyone for attending and supporting the symposium and coming to our personal community. We thank all of you who have come from a distance, and we also thank you if you want to leave a few dollars here or in this area. We believe in economic generation uh, uh, here, so we'll drop a dollar or two in the pot when you're here being at our restaurants and buying some gas. The symposium certainly is recognized as an outstanding tourism event. There's many in our area and we really appreciate you all, your visitors that have come from a distance to take time to come to our community. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, officially Mr. Dan Magruder, KTBO Television. Uh, the support provided by KTBO Television for the Missouri Livestock Symposium uh, is on uh, gone back through the years. It's deeply appreciated and the success of the symposium is absolutely directly linked to their help and involvement. So we thank the staff and thank you, Dan, for all that you do. It takes a lot of talented people to collaborate and to coordinate. And the folks that make things easier for us in this involvement are those individuals that show up every year and help us. I'll now turn the microphone over to Dan McGrew. Anyway, I'm sure the neighbors and 
in uh, the Cap County are going to be pleased that they have a celebrity in their, in their news. Routinely during this Friday evening program, uh, recognition is given to an individual or an organization for outstanding achievements and distinguished contributions to the livestock industry. Eligible applicants uh, can be producers of livestock, agribusiness personnel, agency personnel, agricultural education, ed educators in the state of Missouri. Other longtime supporters of the Missouri livestock industry are also considered for this award. Selected applicants become members of the Missouri Livestock Symposium Hall of Fame. We, re we are regretful that the selection committee did not receive applications this year for, the, for that prestigious award. So that's why I'm providing information for you. I want you to encourage, uh, consider nominating, uh, encourage other individuals to uh, think of worthy educators, agency personnel, educators, producers, etc that could um, uh, be nominated for this award. Application information is located on our website, MissouriLivestock.com, or speak with any of the committee members about the use of process to do that. So you'll also see out in the Commons area, there is a photo display of uh, past recipients of that annual award. So we want that to continue. So be thinking of individuals that certainly deserve the recognition um, and can be, can be honored in that way. We are so very proud to have the 20, 2022 Missouri State Fair Queen with us tonight, Miss Elsie Kiger. She resides with her parents, Jim and Elisa Kiger, on their family farm, Kiger Cattle LLC, that's in by the Grove in Scotland County. Elsie is an entrepreneur, having established her own butchered beef business. She has customers across the Midwest. In addition, she's quite the articulate spokesperson for our ag industry. She shares knowledge and passion for the farm to fork process of meat production. She'll soon graduate from Scotland County R1 High School in May. She plans to attend the University of Missouri, MIC. Thank you. She's a member of 4-H FFA Band and 4-H Intermediate Female State Champion in shooting sports, and she's involved in many local church Activities. Please welcome our own Miss Elsie Kiger, 2022 Missouri State Fair. Thank you for our great introduction, Andy. Like she said, I'm Elsie Kiger, the 2022 Missouri State Fair Queen. I'm a senior at Scotland County R1 High School, and I live on my family's 500-acre family farm, where we raise about 120 head of commercial crossbred cows and calves. I do many different tasks on the farm, from mowing the yard to helping with the cattle drives every year, when we move them in the spring from winter pasture to summer pasture, and in the fall from summer pasture to winter pasture. Usually, I'm considered the gun girl when we work cattle making sure that my uncle has all of the right guns equipped with the right medicine, making sure I'm accurately recording the tag numbers and keeping the tagger loaded for him. This summer, when my brother decided to go to the Army, there was a big job to fill. Somebody had to do the grunt work and bring the cattle up the chute, so that became my job. I've shown cattle since I was eight years old. My first calf was a bottle calf named Peppermint Patty. When he was born, he was about 50 pounds and couldn't reach his mom's udder. Then, his mom stepped on one of his back hooves, so we decided it would be best to make him a bottle calf. One of my favorite peppermint patty stories is that he was a yard calf, so since he was so little, we didn't think he was going to run off. He just lived in our yard with our dogs. One night, the cattle had moved up to the pasture next to our house, and we come home, and Peppermint Patty sitting there with the old basset hound looking at the cows, saying, what are these? Because I'm pretty sure I'm a dog. Over the years, I've shown many different steers and heifers for my parents, for my family's cattle operation. They've always been homegrown, farm-raised beef, which meant we probably weren't going to win the show, but we always tried to win the rate of game competition. In 2019, I showed for the first time at the Missouri State Fair. I showed at the carcass show, which meant that the cattle were judged on the hoof and on the rail for their meat quality and cut ability. 
This was pretty well the first time I was exposed to the beef cow side of the industry rather than the show stop or the cow calf operations. This sparked my interest to create my own butcher beef business. In the summer of 2020, when we had no traditional county fair, I had to find something to do with a fully finished, homegrown 4-H show steer. I didn't want to lose money on my project, since I had put a little bit extra in the feed to make it win right again, hopefully. I didn't want to lose money on my project, and my dad had the great idea to butcher the meat and sell it to consumers. In 2020, I realized that I was providing a lot of people a valuable service. When the supply chain crisis happened, the supermarket meat prices skyrocketed, which meant it was harder to get what you needed at the grocery store and for a decent price. So with my business, I was able to offer them a bulk amount of meat at a better price and a better quality. And they knew exactly where it was coming from, what it ate, where it lived, and where it was butchered. A couple months after that, we had three open heifers, and I decided to buy them for my family farming operation and finish them to sell as butcher cats. As I started to get the word out to my family circle of friends and acquaintances, I was shocked with the amount of people that I've known to be bright people that have never been educated on the logistics of a beef cattle operation. I took it as my part as a producer and salesman of my own product to feed the world, all the while using opportunities like my business to advocate for the agriculture industry and the beef cattle industry. I've had customers from all over the United States, ranging from Des Moines to Kansas City, St. Louis, Huntsville, Alabama, and Newburgh, North Carolina. I'm so passionate about advocating for the agriculture industry and specifically the beef cattle industry that I've completed the Masters of Beef Advocacy Training funded by the Beef Checkoff. I found that I really love to talk to people and advocate for agriculture. The Missouri State Fair Queen title is one more way that I'm allowed to talk to people and advocate for the industry. Through this title, I've also been able to meet a lot of leaders and influencers in the industry that have really inspired me. After high school, I planned on attending the University of Missouri at Columbia and pursuing a degree in Ag Business Management with a minor in Animal Science. Once I'm out of college, I would like to keep growing my butcher beef business, either as a hobby or full time, with the new knowledge and information that I've learned to make my business better and the agriculture industry better as a whole. Thank you guys. involved in marketing and advertisement for her family uh, and a seed stock operation. Did I mention? She's a seventh grader here at this school. She also has a handmade business called Flashes from the Farm. And if anybody would like, she actually has a booth here in the trade show. Madeline recently participated in the National Junior Angus sh uh, Show Speech Competition. She placed third on the national level. We have invited her to share her thoughts with us on beef and kids and knowledge 
Oh my, maybe laugh there. Please help me welcome Miss Madeline Sampson. Care products we use to take care of our pets. 
If consumers are not aware of the crucial role you can have within the production of many necessities, respect and protection of the beef industry could be lost. The lack of knowledge about the beef industry will continue to decline if kids are not properly educated. The stakes are high. Thank you. Well, did you hear me say earlier the future of our agricultural industry is strong, right? We have articulate, enthusiastic young folks that are eager to share their information with the consumer. Thank you, Madam. That was wonderful. I want to remind you that the doors to our trade show open at, uh, tomorrow morning at um, 9, <laughs> 8, uh, the educational program begins at 9. We have a great lineup of speakers from coast to coast, so don't miss the opportunity to hear from some of the best. Certainly those individuals in the livestock industry that are going to be speaking on beef cattle, horses, meat goats, sheep, forages, uh, stock dogs, as well as the talks on marketing fundamentals, building resistance in pastures, farm estate plans and, and succession planning, flower arranging. A reminder to the interested folks that the flower arranging session with Jennifer Shooter actually begins at 2 p.m. Rather than 3 p.m., I think was printed in the booklet. Uh, pollinators and plants session uh, will begin at 11. Um, I encourage you all to look to page 39 and 40 in the program book. This is an important announcement. You will see an evaluation form. We wish for everyone to complete the evaluation, remove it from the book, and share your opinion with the committee. There's a box at the registration for you to leave your evaluation page. And listen carefully. There is an enticement and an incentive for you to submit your evaluation. Those attendees who complete and submit the evaluations will be entered into a drawing and it's cold, hard cash. Won't pay if you don't play, so send those evaluations to us. Certainly can be worthy of your time to offer your opinions and your guidance to us. So fill it out. I now am so pleased to invite to the podium uh, a young man who seems to be somewhat wise beyond his years. I'm a grandma, and this young man is just quite a wise young man. He provides hands-on assistance to area producers that are involved in the Show Me Select Heifer program. He enables increased net income for those area cattle operations. He's been recognized by Missouri Farm Bureau as the outstanding extension specialist of our state. He's a mentor to many of our uh, individuals that are involved in the uh, professional circle of ag educators. This young man is an essential leader of this symposium event. He stands tall, not only in the physical stature, but certainly tall in the eyes of many of us as he provides knowledge and guidance and wisdom. Please welcome the famed Zach Irwin. Appreciate that introduction, Andy. Uh, <clears throat> I got a $20 bill in my pocket later for saying all those really nice things on you know, when administrators are in the room. So, uh, I just want to say on behalf of Dan Sullivan and Sullivan Auctioneers, that are longtime Platinum Level sponsors, it is my honor uh, to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. And uh, as, as we came into the final days of planning this event and as we reflected on the schedule tonight, um, Andy, whether we really intended for this to all come full circle or we kind of probably more likely backed into it, um, I, I hope all of you have seen, um, you know, what we we're trying to, to paint tonight. Uh, you've already heard from two extraordinary young women, both involved in animal agriculture, 
sharing their very unique perspectives. Uh, Diana Rogers is a registered dietitian by training and a real food nutritionist. She runs a clinical nutrition practice and speaks internationally about the intersection of optimal nutrition and environmental sustainability. Diana co-authored the best-selling book, The Sacred Cow, and also was the producer and director of the film, The Sacred Cow, The Case for Better Meat. I had to admit to Diana when we were uh, talking earlier out uh, there that I, I had the book, I had, I had bought the book, I was going to read the book, and I had not gotten to it yet until I was chored one day, uh, feeding my cows, and I stumbled on the Joe Rogan show. So now I've given you a little bit of insight into how I've met speakers, right? I, I listened to Joe Rogan, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it was, it, it, if you had not heard uh, Diane and Rob on the Joe Rogan show, I would invite you to go look that up. Very interesting. I had to listen to it two or three times uh, to let it all sink in. So then after that, uh, I dove into the book and uh, then I said, i got to start chasing Diane Rogers. I've got to have her at the Missouri Livestock Symposium. And so to set the stage a little bit tonight, and I, or I hope to set the stage, uh, then I took some excerpts from the book, but I'm going to paraphrase a little bit uh, to kind of give an example of what we're talking about. And in the conclusion of the sacred cow, uh, they say, we cannot afford not to change how we are growing and eating our food. Our personal health, financial well-being, as well as collective rule strength, and our natural resources depends on that change. We do not face a predicament, we face a problem. One that is not technological, moral, or even genetic. Our problem is our perspective, and our way forward will be defined by what perspective we choose to embrace. I thought those were very prophetic words. And I would give, as a, if I would go to a, on a farm and talk to a farmer, I would give a quick example of perspective. And I would pose the question, has government involvement in agriculture been good for you? That's a rhetorical question. I don't need you to shout the answer to that because the answer is going to be different based on their perspective. So we can take a lot of perspectives to know. But tackling tough topics is one of the strengths of the Missouri Livestock Symposium. So I am so pleased to welcome Diana to the stage tonight, and I hope you will welcome her to the Missouri Livestock Symposium. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to be turning around and looking at my slides. Um, thank you also for eating dinner, sitting through one hour of talks, and now still being in the room. For me, I'm going to try to make this um, quick and lively. So unless you've been living under a rock, you may have noticed some people complaining about cows. They are misunderstood nutritionally, environmentally, and ethically. So steak today is way worse than butter could ever have been because not only are we ruining our health, but we're also killing beautiful animals and destroying the planet, right? So we've got a huge problem to tackle here with dismantling this anti-meat narrative. And it's a really powerful narrative. I just got back from Egypt. Um, I was at the UN climate change talks, there were hardly anyone that was pro-livestock, let alone a nutritionist that was pro-livestock. I saw a lot of very rich people who could afford to fly there, talking about how we all need to reduce our meat intake for the planet and for our health, with no education in agriculture or nutrition really dangerous what's going on on the global stage. So this is what I do most of the day. It's like a game of whack-a-ball. So I'm just going to go through the top 10 arguments against me that I hear frequently. Um, I actually recently made a uh, meat quick facts guide that uh, anyone who signs up for my newsletter at Global Food Justice, which is my nonprofit, can get. Uh, it's intended to help you with your um, dinner conversations when the family gets together and you've got that like one vegan sister-in-law that demands that meat is not okay. Um, so, 
And some of you may, maybe in the back of your head, be wondering about some of these things. Does meat cause cancer? Does meat cause heart disease? Can't I just eat plants and not eat meat? Don't cows use too much water? Aren't cows inefficient with feed? Don't cows use too much land? Aren't the greenhouse gases driving climate change? Isn't eating meat unethical? And shouldn't we all eat less meat? So basically, I'll, one of these questions will come to me through social media. I'll start answering it very scientifically and logically, and then they throw one of these next questions at me, one of these next questions at me. And so that's why you don't see a lot of, I think, um, nutrition influencers really defending me because you kind of have to be an expert in all of these topics if you're going to wade into any argument at all. And so what we're seeing from market research is there's two types of people that are sort of um, buying less or no meat. There's the rejectors who are completely going away from meat and they're really doing that for animal welfare reasons. Um, but the good news is about 85% of them will give up being a vegan after about three months because it's just not a sustainable diet. Humans are omnivores and it's pretty miserable to be a vegan. So I don't even bother arguing with vegans, but it's the reducers that I'm trying to sway. So the reducer is somebody who is nervous about their health. That's their health and the price are the two main reasons why people are reducing their meat intake. But luckily, if you look at the sales, I was just at the Canvas, uh, uh, sorry, the Kansas Livestock Symposium the other day, and we saw some market research. Beef sales are really strong nationwide. There's, there's not a problem right now with beef sales. Um, and so you might think there's not really a consumer problem, but I point out that there is some concern that I have with younger consumers and making sure that meat stays on the table. This is the type of person that I talk to. So somebody who is urban, they're concerned about the environment, they're concerned about their health, they've been educated to think that cattle are driving climate change, they have never been to a farm. They don't understand any of the aspects of why livestock are important. And then on the policy level, we've got this problem right now with carbon tunnel vision is what I call it. So everyone is so overly focused on just reducing carbon emissions at any cost. They're not looking at any of the other considerations you might have with whether or not we should be producing a certain food. So all of these other things need to come into play, and these are the types of things that um, we really need to be owning as people who are pro-livestock, that you know, cattle are important for biodiversity. They're, they're not just these carbon-emitting animals. There's so many other things to cattle. And one of the big things I try to get across through my book and my film and the work I do is that this is the best use of solar energy for food. Capturing the sun's energy directly through plants and turning that into meat is the best way to be producing our food. But what we're hearing from programs like Meatless Mondays, um, which has now taken over the New York City public schools, um, and not only do I have a problem with that nutritionally, and a lot of parents might think, well, what's wrong with giving kids a salad one day a week. Why are you being so radical about that? First of all, there's not just salad, and I'll, I'll show you some examples, but secondly, this type of messaging that Meatless Mondays puts out, that's complete propaganda, and it's not even true. So livestock do not create more greenhouse gases than the transportation sector, that's completely false. Um, decreasing your chance of getting diabetes by 15% is statistically insignificant and also just poor science. And meat does not cause kidney disease. That's absolutely untrue as well. But Meatless Mondays, which is largely funded by Beyond Burger and Johns Hopkins University, gets to put this type of messaging in schools like New York City, where 70% of the kids are low income, 10% are homeless. We've never had any evidence showing that pulling meat away from at-risk kids will actually benefit them in any way. 
This is from uh, Vox Instagram, and I'm just showing you an example of some of the radical media messages that are out there. Vox is a pretty popular um, news source for millennials. Um, and here they're saying Americans eat more than almost anyone else in the world when it comes to meat. 174 animals per person a year. But if you look at the list, 137 of them are shrimp. <laughs> So I looked up the rules of ethical journalism and called them out and said that, you know, according to the code of ethics for journalists, they are supposed to take special care not to misrepresent, oversimplify um, when sum summarizing a story, and certainly they are. I also called out the um, mayor of the New York City Public Schools because not only are they vegan Mondays, or sorry, Meatless Mondays, but they're also vegan Fridays now. So imagine these poor kids in New York City going home to food insecure homes, and now they're bookmarked on Monday and Friday with also food insecure lunches. There's, I call this unethical. And this is what the vegan Friday school lunches look like. It's not a salad, it's not healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, they're getting these ultra-processed burritos, which, by the way, have cheese in them, so they're not even vegan, um, and a bag of Tostitos on the side. And so if you think about the typical kid, maybe the typical urban kid that is food insecure, like, what types of foods do you think that they tend to gravitate towards? Kids like chicken fingers, pizza, um, maybe like deli sandwiches, burgers, things like that. So if you're telling these kids that meat is bad, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to go order a sandwich with no meat on it. They're going to get a, like, it's not like they're going to go to the salad bar and get an $18 quinoa, kale, chickpea salad. They're just going to get, you know, a, a cheeseburger with no cheeseburger in it or something like that. So moving on to what are the major nutrient deficiencies worldwide? So we know that one in two preschool age children um, suffer from at least one micronutrient deficiency, two in three women of reproductive age. It's largely iron and B12 are the top nutrient deficiencies. Those are best found in animal source foods. B12 is only found in animal source foods. We also know um, among women, and this is not just developing countries like Africa, this is also in the UK and in the US, and this is a good argument for why it's not just we need to eat less meat in the US, but let people in developing countries have meat. We all need to be eating meat. One in five women in um, the UK and the US suffer from iron deficiency. Now what about meat causing cancer? Some of you may have heard, if you Google meat cancer, it's all over the internet, right? That eating bacon is just as bad as smoking cigarettes. But let's look at that a little bit. So um, there's a big difference when you're looking at science research between the relative risk and the absolute risk. And so what they found was eating 50 grams of processed meat every single day for the whole rest of your life raises your chance of getting colon cancer from 5%, which is everyone's general chance of getting colon cancer, to 6%. So it's only a 1% increase, but the media calculates that out. They round it up from 18% to about 20%, and they'll say you have 20% higher chance of getting colon cancer from eating processed meat. They're really sort of taking it out of context. In the case of cigarettes, you have a 30 times higher chance of getting cancer. So 30 times versus a 1% chance. Additionally, when we're looking at nutrition research, it's really tricky to tease out one specific food and say that that food is what is causing the problem. So most nutrition research is based on diet recall, which they've done studies on that, and they know that that's a very unreliable way of collecting research on people. So um, if I were to ask most of you within the last month, how many times did you eat meat? It's hard to know, right? It's hard to remember. How many times did you eat broccoli? How many times did you eat vegetables? 
How many times do you drink water? It's just really, really hard to collect data on that. And it's also hard to compare a typical vegetarian to a typical meat eater and say it's definitely the meat that's the problem. We know that typical vegetarians eat lots of more um, fresh fruits and vegetables than a typical omnivore in America. Typical vegetarians also exercise a little bit more. They're a little less likely to smoke and drink. So all of those things have to come into play, not just whether or not someone eats meat. The studies are also based on very shaky science. So just because something is associated with something else, it doesn't mean that's what caused it. So for example, this is per capita cheese consumption, and it correlates perfectly with the people who have died becoming tangled in their bed sheets. But that doesn't mean that eating cheese caused someone to die of getting tangled in their bed sheets. But that's the same logic that they're using when they look at this research and say, oh, this person ate meat, and this person got heart disease, it must be the meat. There's so many other factors at play. So if we look at the typical American diet, these are the types of things we would see. I would, as a dietitian, would argue that that hamburger patty in there, or the hot dog, are the two healthiest things on this slide. And we only have one true randomized controlled trial, an experimental trial that looks at meat versus less meat. And it was done in Kenya and children. And kids in the school either got a meat snack, a milk snack, or extra calories versus a control group. And the kids that got the meat snack did better academically, physically, and behaviorally in all three categories. So meatless Mondays, vegan Fridays, completely going against the only evidence that we have. And also when they looked at health food shoppers, so you know, like a Whole Foods type uh, shopper, they have also found no difference at all between meat eaters and vegetarians. So the, that sort of accounts, your, your typical health food shopper has a similar lifestyle, no difference at all in um, morbidity or mortality. But maybe we're eating too much meat, maybe we all need to eat less meat. How many of you think maybe Americans are eating too much meat? Does anybody know per day how much a typical American eats as far as red meat goes? Anyone want to guess? A quarter of a pound. Quarter of a pound. Anyone else? I know it's late. Okay, it's less than two ounces per person per day in beef. Less than two ounces per person per day. But there's a perception that all Americans are sitting down to a 72 ounce tomahawk steak every single night. That might be from Flint Flintstone, I don't know. What are we eating more of? So between 1970 and 2017, you can see that red meat consumption actually has gone down, but that we're eating more chicken, oils, grains, and sugar than ever before. And the grains are not like pearl, barley, or like brown rice, it's ultra-processed foods. And now we know that uh, a recent study came out that almost 60% of our diet in America is ultra-processed foods. This is what we need to be kind of down on, not meat consumption, not protein consumption. And so when we're comparing, you know, everyone's saying that, you know, these fake meat alternatives are better. You know, one message that really resonates with young people is real. And I think that that's definitely a message that the livestock industry needs to play up a lot more. That a hamburger is beef compared to all of these ingredients. And actually, um, I heard Frank Mintloner was here uh, last year. So he has a really great Twitter post that he did comparing, um, I think it was Impossible Foods or Beyond Burger to dog food. And you really couldn't tell the difference at all between the ingredients. It's wonderful. So who wins when we vilify meat? Who is behind the vilification of meat? I certainly think that a lot of the people that are pushing for a plant-based diet do believe that they're doing good by the world. Like I, I, I don't think most of them are sinister, but I do think that there are sinister players involved in the anti-meat narrative. Ultra-processed foods love it when they're not blamed for our poor health. 
we also have Beyond Meat and other companies like that that can make a lot of profit if we can just build high meat. The oil industry can also profit from that as well. So what happens if we just eliminate all livestock in the US? There was a study that looked at what would happen, and they found that the greenhouse gas emissions would only go down 2.6%, but we would see a huge rise in calorie consumption, which is not gonna do America any good, in carbohydrate consumption, which also is not something we wanna do when our diabetes rates are rising, and we would see a rise in nutrient deficiencies. So calcium, vitamin A, B12, and essential fatty acids would all increase as far as their nutrient deficiencies. Now moving into the environmental argument, this is the game-changing argument, I think, for most people who think that cattle are destroying the planet and that we need to just eat plants instead of cows. The majority of people have no idea that most cattle are grazing on land that you actually can't crop. People have no idea. So this is my like lead-in to maybe you have the story wrong. It's just to explain that there's arable land and then there's more marginal land where cattle are being grazed. And today, right now, 85% of our beef cattle are grazing on land that can't be cropped. That's amazing. Because also, most people think that beef cattle spend their entire lives in the lots. They have no idea. There was one study that also looked at what is the economic benefit of having cattle on public land. And this isn't even regenerative grazing, this is just typical grazing on public land. And they found that for every beef cow, it was over $1,000 in ecosystem benefits. So explaining this to people is also something that's really great, especially with policymakers when you show them economic values. It's really wonderful. So there's nothing healthier, more sustainable, or ethical about something like lab meat. And I don't know how many of you heard that the FDA just approved lab meat for human consumption, like just within this last week. It's gonna hit the market by the, within the next several months. A lot of people also don't realize that livestock can take food we can't eat and turn it into magical protein and B12 and iron and all these great things that humans need. One great statistic I like to also use um, is that for every pound of plant-based protein, there are four pounds of waste that come from that. So we can either let that sit in a pile and make greenhouse gases, or we can feed that to cattle and actually upcycle that into protein. What's the most efficient way to use that waste from the plant-based protein? So even if someone personally doesn't want to eat meat, they should not be anti-cattle. This is a great chart also. All of these can be found at sacredcow.info and then also on Global Food Justice. I have these as well and then please share if you like. Uh, this is just showing that uh, the emissions from the livestock, uh, from the beef um, industry is less than 2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And this is adjusted for carbon equivalents. So you can see transportation, energy, and industry are by far the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions. This chart gets a little complicated in my film. It's animated and it's described by Jason Roundtree of Michigan State. I also have a video of this that I recently um, posted on my LinkedIn page. You can follow me under my name, Diana Rogers, on LinkedIn. Um, also translated into Spanish. But basically what this is showing is that the carbon emissions from fossil fuels should not be compared with the carbon emissions from cattle. So in the case of fossil fuels, it's unlocking ancient stored carbon and methane from the Earth's core and pumping it directly into the atmosphere, as opposed to the emissions from cattle, which are just taking grass, digesting it, belching the methane, but then after 10 years that methane gets broken down into CO2 and water, the water becomes part of the rain cycle, the CO2 goes back into the grass, oxygen gets released, which is what we breathe, 
and that carbon molecule becomes grass or roots or gets fed to the microorganisms underground. So it's a cyclical pattern. It's a flow gas compared to the fossil fuels. When it comes to water, it's also incredibly misunderstood. So most of the water that is attributed to cattle is actually moisture that's already in the grass that they're eating or in the other food that they're eating. So it's not like cattle are just drinking bathtubs and bathtubs full of water, but that's what Meatless Mondays would like these kids to think. And they even have a graphic that they post in the schools that show that for your quarter pound burger, it took 10 bathtubs full of water. Completely misleading and unethical. It's not okay. Oops, this is not a, here we go. Um, one of the cool presentations I went to was by the leather industry uh, at COP, and um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but 150 million hides are being thrown out every year. It's a complete waste. And companies like these electric vehicle companies that are now proudly touting that they're using animal-free leather, that was the most biogenic part of the car, was the leather. Um, so we get a lot of products that are obviously, if you all know this, but just pointing this out to customers um, and you know your average consumer is really important. There's also an environmental cost to overconsumption when it comes to people. Um, we've got the impact due to plastics, we've got in the impact due to excess food production, the impact due to transportation stress from excess weight, and also the healthcare burdens and all the plastics that go along with things like dialysis that can be avoided if people just eat a more evolutionarily appropriate diet. Um, so one of the main drivers, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is cost for people. People are really nervous about the rising cost. Um, but I think we need to start looking at nutrients and not pounds of food per dollar. So I went to walmart.com and looked up the price of strawberries, candy bars, cookies, and protein powder and found that organic grass-fed beef is actually cheaper per pound than these foods. And then also these um, expensive coffee drinks that everyone's drinking. Um, almost done. I know you guys all want to go home, go to sleep. Uh, I'm just going to show you just briefly some of this carbon tunnel vision and what's happening at the policy level. So we're seeing um, these carbon offset, you know, people in New Zealand, for example, are being encouraged to take grazing land completely out of food production and plant non-native monocrops of trees. Oops. Well, some of you may have heard with Ireland needing to cull up to 1.3 million cattle to reduce emissions. That's not going to reduce demand, that's just going to put Irish farmers out of business. People are still going to eat as much butter and cheese and beef as they did before. Now they're just going to, instead of getting it from Ireland, they're going to get it from Brazil or New Zealand or the US. Um, New Zealand is now taxing farmers. I'm about to do a podcast with um, a livestock farmer from New Zealand. And now we also have the White House um, teaming up with a group called ACLM, which is a lifestyle medicine group. Lifestyle medicine sounds very benign, but their nutritional policy is vegan. So this is what's coming down the pipeline. So my main point through Global Food Justice Alliance is that it's actually unethical to make a mass call to pull back on livestock. Livestock upcycle food we can't eat on land we can't farm into the perfect food for people. They're less susceptible to drought or extreme weather, like hailstorms. They can survive that when um, crops can't. About 12% of the world's population relies solely on livestock for their income, so livestock are incredibly important for rural communities. They also contribute to gender equality, so women in about half the world can't own land, but they can own livestock. That's 2022, women 
still can't own land in half the countries in the world. I also harp on this idea of food sovereignty, so the ability for communities to be able to feed themselves. So all people deserve access to nutritious food produced regionally and sustainably. Livestock are uniquely nutritious. They provide nutrients that plants absolutely cannot provide. Fake meat does not contribute to food sovereignty. And forced restriction is actually cultural and moral imperialism. So just because someone in LA who has an access to Whole Foods wants to go vegan, it doesn't mean that they have the right then to go tell other people who either don't want to or can't give up meat because they need those nutrients. It's actually incredibly unethical for them to do that. They don't like it when I point that out. Oops. Hey, just trying to hold me up. Oh. I think I have one more slide, but it doesn't matter. I was, I was done anyway. Or maybe that's just this little way of telling you that I've gone over time. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that was that was with my second to last slide. I just had the final slide on there that was showing there. This is it. So if you want to follow me, um, globalfoodjustice.com is my nonprofit that actually helps fund the advocacy work that I do. Um, I also have a uh, Instagram handle for that, Global Food Justice, and then Sustainable Dish is my nutrition consulting business, and um, my social media for that is a little more punchy, a little more direct on, social, on a sustainable dish. And um, I don't know if, if you want to ask me a question, I don't know if we have any time, or I'm happy to stand outside and answer any questions. Um, thank you for having me. Oh. Yes, the book is available wherever books are sold on Amazon. The film Sacred Cow is on Amazon Prime. What What is the percentage of, the, of our meat controlled by a quarter country right now? By meat and the pork? What is our percentage of? Of the meat that foreign countries have got control of in the United States. That foreign countries have control of? Yes. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, the majority of beef that's produced in the U.S. is produced on family farms, and then if if it ends up at a feedlot, that's when it. But the pork industry, most all of the of them, is controlled by, by China. Mm. Does Does people know that? So I primarily focus on beef, um, just because cattle are the most vilified, so I haven't done as much research into the pork industry. Um, so I'm not, I don't have the statistics on that off the top of my head. Well, that's, that's one, one thing that I am totally against, is when these foreign countries come in there and buy up our, our pork producing and packing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. What, what can we do to help spread the, the message that you know, cattle are, are good, that we need in a good for the environment? Yep. Um, definitely take a look at the book that I have because I've I've gone through all of the main arguments that people will use against me, and I've, I've laid them all out, and I have all the um, references in my book. Uh, I also have graphics for pretty much all the main arguments, and you can share all of those. Um, I, I have two types of pushback. I have like extremist vegan type people that are not listening, and they just get deleted and blocked. I don't even ever um, interact with them. There then are concerned people that just have misinformation. And it can take a long time. Um, I actually like, have an assistant that I pay to handle those for me, um, who can sound like me, and she goes on Instagram and answers all of those types of things. So it, I mean, it, it takes a lot of energy. Um, and unfortunately, people don't trust industry. So having somebody independent is really helpful. Um, 
instead of you know somebody who maybe you know gets accused of like making their living off meat. to universities. Um, it's more received at, through livestock type programs than through nutrition type programs. So in the nutrition world, it is very controlled by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and they are very set um, in their philosophy and very much not open to the fact that meat is actually a healthy food that and that our protein, that the, the RDA for protein is set too low. But isn't that where it needs to be heard? I know, yeah. Um, in, I do see through the animal science departments um, much more receptivity to these messages. And, um, and even there was a, a senator um, out of Oregon whose chief staff read the book and watched the film, and um, there was a bill in the Senate to try to get better grazing practices on public land because of the work I do. So that's good. But nutrition is a really hard one. Well, and, and we don't have good like that. It, it's not their fault. They're being taught that, uh, you know, something like going meat vegetarian or vegan is a really good thing, but then um, the idea that we maybe need to eat less processed foods is like totally radical and you can't cut out the entire food groups. That's, that's why I said it. The way that I'm breaking up the universities. Yeah. Um, so I personally have not eaten any of the fake meat. Um, I I have celiac disease, so I, I'm very allergic to gluten, and I happen to eat much more meat than even a typical person eats. Like I, that's pretty much the majority of what I eat. Um, I know nutritionally it can't compare. There's absolutely no nutritional benefits at all to eating a fake meat product compared to a real meat product because you can't even when they add the fake vitamins and minerals in, it, they're not absorbed the same way as actually eating it in the real food form from the real animal. Yes? The other thing is, you don't know what's really in it. Yeah, that's true. You don't really know what's in it. Yeah. Anything else? This is, yes? When your first slide, Um, 
it, it makes no sense to me at all. Um, the Netherlands is actually one of the worst countries right now as far as emissions, um, and they're forcing farmers to sell out. They're actually forcing farmers to stop farming because of nitrogen. Um, so I'm trying. But, and there's not enough people like me out there. I'm pretty much the only one doing this. Still trying. And in particular, in the more urban areas and on the coast, these kids are even, the, the homeschool movement is not strong. Um, I can tell you that in, in the town that I live in, outside of Boston, people are very educated, they're concerned about the environment, they're um, concerned about their health, and they definitely don't eat meat. Like, do not eat meat. Um, and I'm an animal nutrition trained person, so not Um, well, that's one of the reasons we're taking this to Instagram and also doing a lot of work on TikTok, um, trying to get to young people, young women in particular, because they're the ones who, women are usually the ones who decide what foods are being cooked in the home. Um, and so we're trying to influence young women to make sure that they understand the value. Yes? No hormones allowed in beef anywhere in the U.S., so that's, yes. No. And, so antibiotics are used in, in the beef industry, um, but it doesn't make it, they've, they've done multiple studies, I write about this in my book, there's no antibiotic residue on a steak. You're not going to ingest antibiotics by eating a steak that, from an animal that was given antibiotics. There's lots of testing that's done, so that shouldn't be a concern. I think mean, that's one of the worst. The antibiotic-free movement is, is really dangerous because sick animals should be treated, and I know that antibiotics are used um, excessively in some cases, but totally antibiotic-free and scaring people from buying any meat that was ever given an antibiotic is also very dangerous. Um, Grass-fed versus finished on um, on a feedlot. Nutritionally, almost no difference at all. 
and I talk about this in the book, um, it's a very, very minimal difference. So I encourage people to support the type of system that aligns with their values. Just, you know, try to buy from a farmer that they know if that's important to them. But we also can't have grass-fed versus typical meat battles within the meat industry because that's what allows the anti-meat movement, the anti-meat movement to get stronger. So I am like meat Switzerland. There's a lot of people that can't access grass-fed meat. They still deserve to eat meat. They should buy. I would rather someone go to the grocery store and buy whatever meat they can afford than almost anything in the middle of the grocery store. We've got huge problems with people that um, can't access, you know, the perfect meat, and so they're buying they're buying processed foods instead. That's the big problem for our health, not whether or not someone's eating grass-fed or beef finished. Yes. Uh, one uh, last question is: Are you working with any of the national cattle associations uh, to get some of this word out? I mean, that, to me, nope. that's, they got a lot of money, they do a lot of everything they do, and those would be good vehicles. I get very little support from them. Uh, I, I get support from, believe it or not, um, Canada Beef has been very supportive of my message. Um, Meat and Livestock Australia, Beef and Land New Zealand, um, very supportive, but the U.S. beef industry is, has not been supportive. Why would that be? Yeah, the Global Food Justice Alliance does not take any industry money at all. Um, that's all publicly funded. Me as a consultant, I personally work with different industry bodies to help them be more sustainable, and I see no conflict of interest with that. Yes. So, as a dietitian who obviously is advocating for meat and beef consumption, how would you also advocate for additional vegetable consumption to round out the diet, um, given like Western culture's different diet? I'm not anti-vegetable, well, but I, I also I wasn't suggesting. Yeah, it's um, good to eat vegetables as well. Um, you know, the problem is people think that vegetables give us a lot more than they actually give us. So you have to eat so many fresh fruits and vegetables to get even an eighth of the nutrition that you can get from a very small piece of meat. Um, and so while I think that fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables are really important, what I've seen, for example, in, in the Boston farmers markets, people can use their food stamp money to get double the value of uh, produce, but they can't use it for meat. So that $6 pint of organic raspberries, they get double their money, or that $10 bag of mescaline mix, which, I mean, at the end of the day, lettuce has the nutritional value of a tissue. But people are putting so much weight on fresh fruits and vegetables when, in New England, we can grow meat all year round, and it is just so much more nutrient dense than any amount of lettuce that someone can possibly eat. So I think there's a lot of people out there advocating for fruits and vegetables. I think everyone pretty much understands that we need to eat more fruits and vegetables. There's not many people advocating for meat. So it's not that I'm anti-fruit and vegetable. I just think that they're overly glorified and they really don't provide us with um, the essential vitamins and minerals that we can get from, we can get almost everything we need from animals. What I don't, what I really push also is that we need less ultra processed foods. Okay, I know it's really late, so I'm gonna. Yeah, please. So if you look right up there, Missouri Beef Industry Council, 
has been one of our platinum sponsors for a long, long time. And when I sat down and I said, I'm going to bring Diana Rogers, and here's the message tonight. 100% on board. She was very much on board. So if you want to, I, I, I hear you on the national checkoff level. I, I very much hear that. Um, on, on the Missouri level, I, I've always said those dollars get spent better locally and, and closer to you than they probably do bigger. But um, this is how your dollars have worked uh, for producers. And, and to, to have Diana be with us tonight, share that message, and then take that message abroad, I think that's money very well spent. So I just had to, had to make that clarification so that uh, I don't get nasty emails or anything like that moving we'll forward. So I want, I, I want to thank Diana again, and I think she'll hang out a little bit. If anybody wants to talk with her one-on-one -on -one or privately, she, she will certainly do that. I want to thank you all uh, for coming here this evening um, and, and taking in everything that we've got. I would invite you to come back tomorrow. Again, our doors open at 8 o'clock. Uh, our, our educational program start at 9. I, I am so very uh, happy with a lot of the programs this year, and I say this, and I've said it through all the TV and radio interviews I've done. If you don't find something in that program that interests you, I, I don't know. Maybe you're just an uninterested person. It's <laughs> not <laughs> sort of a personal uh, type stuff. So, but again, uh, please uh, come back tomorrow and uh, support the trade show, support the folks that make this happen. Uh, the banners up here, because we, uh, absolutely this program does not exist without our sponsors and supporters. So I think I'll close it uh, tonight. And, and I'm going to remind you again, tonight and tomorrow, there's an evaluation in your book. I, I have showed how easy it is to rip the evaluation page out. And well, even if you put your phone number on it, you've got a chance to win cash money to do so. So there's, there, there's a box at the front desk. Please uh, take time to fill that evaluation out for us. Uh, tell us what you think because it will uh, it will steer the committee and, and myself moving forward. So with that, Andrea, I think I'll, I'll close the program tonight and say thanks again to Diana. Thank you again to all of you, and I hope you have to see you all again and back here tomorrow.